Okay. Um, Dave uh, has a passion for, for flowers and for photographing flowers, uh, particularly uh, orchids. Uh, and over the uh, past several years, he's developed quite an expertise in uh, focus stacking. And tonight, Dave will share that expertise with us so that we can all get um, uh, all that fine detail available in our photographs. So Dave, um, it's all yours. Thanks, Bill, uh, and thanks everybody for uh, for joining tonight. Appreciate uh, everybody taking time out of their their evening to to watch this. Obviously, we had uh, kind of been hoping that we could have done this at uh, Happy Days, and uh, in, in some ways that would have been nice. Uh, but I will sort of ask your forbearance a little bit. Uh, I'm going to be showing some PowerPoint and then jumping out into doing some, some, some more hands-on stuff in Lightroom and Helicon Focus and, and Photoshop. And Zoom is a little clunky and sharing and unsharing. You, can't, you can only share one application at a time. So it'll take a few seconds to kind of knock one down and put one back up. But uh, um, I, I hope you'll uh, put up with that a little bit. Um, with that, let's just jump right into this and let me do that. All right, uh, we are gonna be talking about focus stacking tonight. I, I, I do get a lot of questions about it. Uh, so I think there is, there is a fair amount of interest. Uh, just, just to sort of set everybody's level here, really focus stacking is it, it, what you're doing is combining images to create a wider or deeper depth of field than you could achieve with a single exposure. That's, 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 that's really what it is. That's, that's all it is. Um, but there's some, some really sophisticated software out there that helps you do that. Um, you can use focus stacking in landscapes. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll talk about landscapes very briefly. Uh, it, it's, it's actually kind of the easy part of, of focus stacking and it's, and it's really straightforward. Much of it is the same that you would use for macro and close-ups, but you just, it tends to be uh, something that uh, is pretty straightforward. So I'll talk about that a bit, but I'll spend most of my time talking about uh, and app applications in macro or close-up photography. Here, you have an issue with uh, depth of field. If you're if you're really close to your subject, uh, you just you just can't get a whole lot of depth of field. And if you stop down a whole lot, uh, your backgrounds can get real clunky. So with uh, focus stacking, you can you can get the best of both worlds. You can get as much depth of field as you want and you can still uh, retain some black background blur. Now I'm gonna show you some, some sort of finished images here. I wanted to sort of lead these lead off with this because I, I just sort of wanted you to see some focus stacked images before you got immersed in the technical details. When I, when I show somebody a photograph, the reaction that I'm hoping to get is, is sort of some variation of, ooh, that's pretty. Um, I don't really want them to say, oh, how many, how many photos did you stack to do that? Or, oh, that must have been hard to do that or, or whatever. I really like them to just enjoy the, the image for what it is. And I think one of the things that's great about focus stacking is you can simplify the image and you can really, uh, you can, you can get a, a particular subject to really stand out. So that's one reason. Number two is that I I've, I've, I've want to show you some sort of nice work uh, right up front because some of the examples that we're going to go through while they're, they're okay images, I picked them in order to illustrate particular points, not because I think they're the best thing I've ever done uh, or something like that. So I, I, I just wanted to show a few 
examples so you can kind of see the sort of things that were that I'm aiming at uh, when I do my focus stacking. Um, you know, you can really get close. The milkwort on this side uh, has got a lot of little dew drops on it. Uh, this whole flower structure is probably three quarters of an inch tall. So it's 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 this was as about as close as I could get with my uh, with my macro gear. And the other thing is, I don't know if you're the same as me, but uh, I always like the the photos that I've taken, you know, the most most recent photos. Uh, you know, I, I always like them. So this is the last slide I added. I added this slide last night because I was out yesterday morning and I took these photos. So, um, you know, I, I figured might as well add some in. Now, if you look at the center one, uh, and we'll talk about this some more as we go through, but this is pretty much in a single plane. I mean, this this little milkweed seed was clutched onto a piece of goldenrod. And if you took your time, you should be able to line up completely parallel with a goldenrod, get everything in one uh, one shot. And, and you, you might not need to use focus stacking. Now, there was a little bit of the fluff, you know, that extended back and extended toward the camera. But one of the things that's really nice about focus stacking is that you don't have to keep adjusting your tripod. You don't have to, you know, get to the point where everything is in perfect, uh, one perfect plane in order to get that picture. Um, if, if you focus stack it and this side is a little closer to the camera than this side, um, it doesn't really matter as long as your focus stack is deep enough to get everything that you're interested in. So the focus stacking really allows you some opportunities in um, composition that I think uh, once you get used to it and uh, get so that you're comfortable with it, they can be very powerful. Now, I, I think of focus, my workflow for focus stacking, I kind of divide into four parts. Uh, and that's the way I'm going to going to talk about it. One in the field, you know, what kind of decisions that you make in the field and what, uh, what consequences they might have uh, uh, for your ability to do a stack or do it easily. Some initial post processing, uh, I use Lightroom in your, uh, you know, editor of choice before you uh, take the pictures into, into uh, the uh, focus stacking software. So I'll talk about what I do there to help ensure a better stack. We'll talk a little bit about the stack, running the stacking software itself and um, you know what you can do there in order to get the best output. And then finally, we'll talk about some post-processing post after you take it out of the stacking software to fix some of the artifacts that um, come into, into uh, the, that are our natural part or unavoidable part of the, of the stacking software. So we're just going to talk, we're going to step through those four uh, topics. So we'll start off with uh, what you might want to do in the field to help yourself out. Uh, you, you, you need a tripod. Um, it's not completely necessary. Uh, I know there are some cameras that will take a whole set of photographs for you. And if you hold it still, um, you, can, you, can, you can get away with that. But if you're doing a stack of 30 or 40 um, and you're trying to really uh, get the best image you can out of it, you want a tripod. You need, the, you need your subject to stand still, to stay still. Um, the focus stacking software can do an amazing job if things move around a little bit. It will align each image as it does the stack to get it as well aligned as it can. But one thing it can't uh, deal with is, is blur from, from motion. So if you've got something that's windy, um, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be a problem. Um, 
you, you really you really want stable lighting because you want the exposure for all of the images that you're going to put together to be the same. And if if you're in a if you're in the woods and uh, uh, you sort of have dappled light coming through and uh, you know some images have a lighter background than the others, it can make it harder to combine the images in post processing. Like usual, you really want, you want good technique uh, to get the best pictures. You want good net technique, uh, some kind of wireless release, some uh, using mirror lockup if that's available to you. Uh, you want to make sure the lighting is good. You know the the ratio of lighting to the your subject to the background is good. I always carry around a reflector and a uh, and a diffuser whenever I'm out. I've always got that hanging off my belt. And you want to make sure that you got enough images in your stack. We'll talk about that a little bit. But the most important thing, of course, is good composition. Um, I think what I would argue to you is you want to practice your focus stacking enough so that it is a comfortable technique for you, so that you're so you can spend most of your time worrying about composition and not so much time worrying about the the technical aspects of the focus stacking. Now we'll go through this pretty quick. Um, you know, here's a kind of a representation of, of the problem. You've got depth of field that's sort of this wide between the two red lines, and it's not big enough to cover the whole um, the whole subject. This is looking at a, a flower or something like that. Um, you could stop down more and more, but then you get uh, clutter in the background. So you can't always get the full subject in focus. So what do you do? You take a whole set of images. Um, this shows eight, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, all with different uh, focus points. And that becomes your base set of images that you're going to process. And it may be eight, it may be 60, uh, depending on how much depth of field you need and how much depth of field that you're, you're getting out of each image. Um, and then you're gonna use the software to combine the sharp portions of each image uh, into a final uh, stack. Now you can create these, uh, this, this sequence of, of pictures uh, a number of different ways. You can have your camera set up on a tripod and you can move the focusing ring slightly for each image. Or you can leave the focus in one spot and move the camera forward slightly. Uh, people use a macro focusing rail for that where it's where the camera is set up on a sort of a a geared uh, travel and you can turn a knob just a little bit and, and control it uh, pretty well. Or there's some cameras now where you keep the camera in place and let the camera do it. And the camera essentially turns the, the, uh, the focusing, adjusts the focusing of the lens for you, but it does it in a way that is much more consistent and uh, better than you can probably do it yourself. Now, when we're talking about turning the focusing ring slightly for each image, when you're talking about macro, it's really hard to get consistent steps when you're doing this manually. And it's very hard to turn the focusing ring a small enough amount that you're, that you're getting the, the, uh, the images stacked close enough together. Um, and you're also, uh, handling the camera, which can jostle things around. So I don't really um, recommend this. I would, I would suggest you either um, think about a macro focusing rail, or if you've got a camera that will do it for you, so much the better. You got to pick your composition. Um, you know, the, the, the normal rules of composition are, are, are still in force, they're still important, and they still determine whether you're um, got a good picture or not. Um, but the, the thing that opens up your compositional opportunities is you're not limited by a focus plane. You, you can have as much depth of field as you want. 
Um, so that's what you want to do. So you're out in the field, uh, live view or some kind of, of uh, looking at the back of the camera to look at the, the image actually is, is your big friend. When I first got a camera with live view, I kind of thought it was a gimmicky sort of thing. I didn't think I would really use it that much. Um, but um, it's something I've come to rely on because you can really evaluate this background. Uh, the first thing I do when I set up a composition is I, I adjust the, uh, uh, the aperture and look at the background and decide what the aperture needs to be to get the background that I want. So that's number one for me. Once I've sort of framed it up, I'm, I'm looking at F4, F8, F11, F16, seeing where I want to shoot it. Once I've done that, then I, um, I, I want to look at this background and see if there's stuff that I still need to, any housekeeping that I need to do. It's amazing how much uh, a dead stalk of last year's plant, how distracting that can be in the background. And if you've got a, some dead plant material in the background, it's, it's not a big deal to, to bend that over or to move that out of the way. Once you have the aperture set, then you can pick your shutter speed and, and, uh, and, and sensitivity, your ISO. Uh, here, you want to keep the, uh, the shutter speed high if there's any chance of, of your subject moving around. I would rather push the ISO higher and, and keep the shutter speed up if there's a possibility of movement uh, than being kind of slavish to a low ISO. So here's, you know, sort of what it looks like as you, as you start to evaluate what the background looks. Here's, here's the same thing shown at F4, F8, F16. F4, the, the background is certainly nicer and less distracting, but the whole, the whole flower is not in focus. At F16, the whole flower is in focus, but so is a lot of gold around the background and if you're familiar with uh, Brexville Prairie, uh, this is the paper recycling dumpster out back. And so I would, I would definitely recommend that you never want to have a, a dumpster in the back of your, in the back of your pictures. So uh, that's, that's not good form. So, um, but anyway, one of the things that you're going to learn is that F4 gives you better backgrounds, but it also may mean that you need to do more processing after you do the stack, because there's going to be more artifacts that you probably have to deal with. And, we're, and I'm going to show you a lot of examples of those and show you ways to deal with those artifacts as well. So here's the kind of trade-offs that you're making. Here's a single exposure at F16. Here's a, a focus stacked exposure. At F5, uh, if you look carefully, you realize these are different, uh, different plants, actually. So I didn't have one exactly the same, but I think you still get the point here that uh, if, if, you, if what you want to do is draw people's attention to the flower, uh, you can certainly um, you simplify this background. You can simply, you can do a lot of things with focusing is you simply can't do with a, with a single shot. Now let's change gears here a little bit. Let's uh, do our uh, couple of minutes on focus stacking for landscapes. And here's a situation that you might want to, to focus stack. Because if this, this uh, rock along here is probably a, a foot or so from the lens. And these trees down here are a couple of hundred yards down the, down the shore. This is up, uh, taken up in Maine. And, and there are times when you'd really like this to be pin sharp from you know, a foot away from the lens to a hundred yards away from the lens. So this is a, a nice application for land, for focus stacking in landscapes. Again, you probably are better off using a tripod. You're probably better off using manual exposure. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But first you wanna, of course, you know, decide what your 
composition is going to be, get everything set, um, you know, try a few things, decide really what the picture needs to be, decide that at first, do a few test shots, dial in the exposure, make sure everything's good. Now you're, now you're ready to generate your set of images for the focus stacking. So you want to, uh, you know, you want to do a series of, of pictures, each focused at a different point, um, starting, you, you can do it in any order, but I'm, I've got it starting closest to the camera and working your way away. So if you focus here, and the reason why I talk about um, doing this uh, in manual exposure, do be aware well, you want the exposure on all the images to be the same, but do be aware that if you have your camera set on an automatic exposure, the exposure will be influenced by where you have the focus uh, set, where the focusing point is set. Um, so if, if, if you're using live mode and you just uh, touch a different couple different places, you know, as you walk back, here's image one, you know, a few feet in, here's image two, here's image three, here's image four. If you put your focusing point over this and, and use autofocus, if, you're, if it's not set up in manual exposure, it's going to change your exposure and you're going to have a whole bunch of different images at different exposures. That's not what you want. So I would suggest that you, uh, uh, Put your camera in manual exposure. That's probably the easiest thing. If you if you want to leave it auto auto exposure, don't move the focus point. Just manually move the focus ring uh, on the camera. Leave the focus point in the same place. But for this is taken with a, a, a wide angle lens. Um, you have a good bit of depth of field. Four images would probably be more than enough to handle this. And because everything one is going to be sharp in this, the focus stacking software will love this. You put that in, hit, hit go on the focus stack, and you're going to be done. So uh, it's really pretty straightforward to do focus stacking for landscapes. Now, just to sort of reiterate a couple of things, you can't fix motion blur, so make sure your shutter speed is fast enough to avoid that. Um, even if that means, you know, uh, the, the software can handle a flower moving a bit from the wind if, if, the, if each image is sharp, even if it's in a slightly different position. Um, so push the ISO rather than risk motion blur. Give yourself a little extra room in the composition. Don't get it cropped in too close. The, the focus stacking may reduce, um, may crop your image essentially, um, especially if, if it's aligning a bunch of, of images that have moved a little bit. Um, so you want a little extra rooms and then you can do at the very end, you can do a final crop. But if you're doing focus stacking, I would give yourself a little extra room. And of course, uh, getting out at dawn is, is great because you usually have the calmest wind of the day. Okay. All right. Uh, let's start talking now about some of the nuts and bolts. Um, so you've, t you've been out in the field, you've got a whole set of images that you want to um, focus stack. I bring them into Lightroom. You can bring them into any image editor of your choice. Focus your initial adjustments on your basic exposure, color balance, don't do a whole lot of clarity, saturation, sharpening, texture, and don't do cropping at this point. What you want to do is save those adjustments, if you're going to do any, to the very end. Lightroom is great 
that you can, it's non-destructive. You can, you can change your mind about some of these things. But if you do them before the focus stack, then, and you change your mind, then you're gonna to have to redo the focus stack. If you wait to do those things until after you've done the photo stack, then you can change them at will later on. So you really want to avoid a whole lot of, of adjustments other than the basics. And the most important to me are exposure and color balance. And this is the most, I, I think maybe the one of the most important things is the highlights. Um, I do a lot of work in my initial uh, work before the focus stacking software on the highlights. Two reasons for that. If I'm taking a picture of a, of a flower, whoops, like this, the brightest area, the highlights are in my subject. And I don't want a big white blob here. I really want to show a lot of texture. I want to show a lot of gradation of, of different brightness in here. So I don't want, I, I want those highlights really spread out and I'll discuss that. The second reason, and this is really specific to focus stacking, is that the, the focus stacking software tends to push your highlights up. I don't, I'm not positive of the reason for that. I think it's essentially that when it processes your stack, it's adding some micro con contrast to help it pick up the sharp areas. And a lot of times that will push your highlights up. Therefore, in your initial processing, you need to pull those highlights down and give yourself a little headroom. Now, here's an image straight out of the camera. This is what it looked like. You can see, you know, nothing's been adjusted here. This is how it came out of the camera. It's, it's bright here. We see it, it's, you know, if you look at the initial histogram, it says it's exposed okay. There's no clipping going on, but we have these peaks here and we've got a blue peak that's sort of out on its own, which essentially says this, this image is a, a, a little too blue. And here's what it looks like when I'm ready to do the initial processing. And so let's look at the differences here. The first thing you're gonna notice is the histogram. And that's really all the, all the adjustments that I've done down here or are in order to get this histogram to look like this. I want that highlight peak to be spread out. And I want the whole thing to be pulled to the left a little bit so I have more room in here. This is, this is, this is something that you play with this focus stacking software enough and, and you'll really uh, start to appreciate this. But I've warmed it up. You can see the difference here, but I've really taken a big whack on the highlights and that stretches this, that pulls this whole area of the, the histogram to the left and spreads those big highlights out. So that's the sort of profile I want um, when I go into photo, uh, when I go into the focus stacking software. So I'm gonna stop sharing this now and we're gonna go over and look at Lightroom and we're gonna, we're gonna play with some of this. Um, can everybody see a, a Lightroom screen at this point? Yep. Okay. All right. Now this is this is an image. This is the way it came out of the camera. Now, what I, I you know, you always want to shoot raw because you want to be able to adjust the, the color balance. And if you have an image that has a big colorful blob in it, like these, like these blooms, they can they can fool the they can, they can fool the, uh, the auto color balance, but hey, this is, uh, 
this is a, a raw file, so it's it's easy to deal with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take this. I'm going to select this entire stack, and then I'm just going to pick out a photo. You know, part way in here, someplace where the, the subject is in reasonable focus. So I picked this this image here. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tweak this. Now I I I've done this before, so I I sort of know. Um, you know what I need to do, but I'm gonna start doing this so you can start seeing what's what's going on here. Oops. And you can see when I, I I just reduced those highlights up here quite a bit. Um, gonna add a little more black to it and maybe just a little bit of texture. But this looks a lot more natural to me. So that's the kind of, of adjustments I want to do. And then um, Lightroom is great. It's got this sync button. You do this, check everything, and just say synchronize. And that's going to take those adjustments and it's going to apply them to every image in the stack. So you only have to do your initial Lightroom adjustments on a single image and then just copy all of those adjustments uh, to uh, to all the others in the photo stack. So let's let's go back to the library. Let's go back in here. Um, let's just pick another example. I'm going to go in. I'm going to select everything, and I'm going to jump in here to one where some of this is is uh in focus and again I, i'm seeing some blues on the highlights here so i think this is too blue i'm gonna warm this up um gotta go into the module. and even though nothing is clipped i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna give myself some more room so i'm gonna Warm this up a little bit. I'm going to increase the magenta a little bit. I'm going to drop the exposure just slightly. Um, and I'm going to work on these highlights and pull them to the right. Uh, I'm going to do the same for the whites, something like that. And uh, I like texture. I, sometimes when I when you when you hurt when you pull the highlights down, you're essentially taking contrast out of this. So I find that adding a little texture, it's a little more subtle than clarity. Adding a little texture back isn't a bad thing to do. So um, and maybe just a little bit of of blacks. So there I have something that looks much more like I want it. And I just hit sync, hit the synchronize button. It does it all up over here. And you can watch it start putting all these changes. So these are ready to go uh, to your focus stacking software. So you go back, go in here. And if you've got Helicon Focus set up as a, as a plugin to, to uh, Lightroom, all you do is go over here, export to Helicon Focus, and that's gonna start creating TIFF images that will automatically uh, be ready to use for Helicon Focus, and it's gonna open up Helicon Focus for you. So that's that's, that's the sort of thing that I do uh, prior to shipping it off to the 
to the focus stacking software. I'm not going to actually hit that button because the, one of the slowest things that that happens here is actually I've got 50 images selected here. 50, creating 50 TIFF images takes a while, so uh, we won't actually do that. So I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm going to come back. We're going to go back in here. Um, so that's that's the initial uh, work that you need to do in Lightroom before you get. Now we need to talk about actually running the focus stacking software. And it's really pretty straightforward. Um, there's a couple, there's a number of different options that you have. Photoshop has a, a photo stacking capability. Uh, there's a software called Zarene, which is uh, that plays nice with Photoshop and, and Lightroom, or there's Helicon Focus. I think Helicon Focus is probably the most popular software. That's that is what I use. That's what I have experience with. That's what I'm going to actually end up talking about uh, with you. But if you want to try this out and you have Photoshop, it's a great place to start uh, if, if you don't have to buy new software. Now you can get into Helicon Focus for as little as $30. That gets you their light version for, for a, year, a year's license. You can, you can license their pro version uh, which I think is worth it for 55, but I think really the, 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 the best deal really is their pro version lifetime license. You can buy that for $200. Uh, it gets their most sophisticated version of Helicon Focus. And for as long as you keep the software, you can update it to their latest version. So it's a perpetual license to their latest version. It's a pretty, it's a really a pretty good deal, I think. It's very sophisticated software. I think it's amazing that they can do it for, for that. Now, once you get into, <coughs> excuse me, once you get into the software in the lower uh, right hand corner, you'll see this that, that talks about the rendering method. And there's three different methods to choose from. And if you just hover the uh, your cursor over method A, it will pop up with this uh, message. It says method A produces smooth transitions and preserves colors. Method B works best for continuous surface. Method C, if you, you know, hover over, over that, it's going to give you the message. Good for intersecting objects and deep stacks. And it's, you know, it's, it's written like I would write it if I were writing uh, something for the software. There's nothing bad about any of these. Just one happens to be particularly good about uh, something than the more more than the other. Here's, here's my take on it. If you just say reset and, and let it go to its defaults, it's going to pick method B. But method A is really my go-to option. Um, I, I find it best for out-of-focus backgrounds. And what's weird about this is that any of these methods will will handle the in-focus bits of a whole bunch of images pretty well. But they do differ quite a bit on how well they do the out-of-focus stuff. They're not set up to understand what you want out of focus, what you want sort of in focus. It's just looking for sharp bits and putting those together. Uh, option one, I think, works the best. If I have issues with that, I'll, I'll kind of do them in this order. I'll, I'll I, and try different things. And you can, you can just, you can do one stack, flip to another method, do another stack and just compare them. So you can just, you can get it your own experience and, and decide, but, but that's, that's my choice. 
then once once you've just once you have picked your method here you just hit the go button right here and and good stuff happens now before we before i actually show you that happening let me talk to you a little bit about their retouching, because I think it's an extremely strong part of the offering. Um, I often use it for out of focus areas. If something looks a little blotchy, I can go in and, and paint in something that looks a lot better. And in areas like this shot, where there's these little water droplets and you've got some strong light off to the side and there can be you know, little flares off of these and things like that, um, the focus stacking software seems to have issues with that. So let's, let's talk about those a little bit. Here's, here's a final image that I put together, some blue cohosh. And I knew I was going to crop this to a four by five. And you can see, you know, essentially where I've cropped this. This is over on the right hand side is what initially came out of the focus stacking software. And, you know, the, the, the flower itself, you know, is, 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 is the same. What's different is that as it was putting this together, this leaf over here went from being out of focus when I originally set up the composition. By the time you know I was done with this stop stack, you know it it it, it assembled you know sharp bits over here, and I don't really want that. But the the retouching allows you to pick any of the initial images and just paint that image over, um, over an area on your final thing. So what I've shown here is what picked the first image where this leaf was the most out of focus. And then you can just go in and you can just with a brush paint, paint over this and make that section of your image look like this. So, uh, we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna go through some examples of that. I'm gonna actually do some of that, but it's a very, very powerful part of the uh, Helicon Focus uh, software. Now here again, here's the initial, there's a, I've zoomed in quite a bit on the initial stacking result coming out of the software. And here, a single image from the stack. And you'll notice these halos over here. You don't, you don't want that. But what you can do is you can tell the software, hey, I want to go to where this is sharp right here. And it'll pick up, it may pick up this image or one similar to it. And you can brush this surrounding area in over here. And you could just get rid of that artifact. So, um, the, the retouching software is, is really, really uh, important in this. So let's, let's go and hopefully you're seeing a Helicon focus screen. That's correct. Okay. So this is, this is what you look like if you've exported some things from Lightroom. Uh, once it's done with its sort of laborious process of creating, you know, lots of TIFF images, um, it's going to look like this. These are all of the all, all of the different layers that I've got that I want the uh, the software to put together. Here's where you can pick your method. That's what I was talking about before. And for this, I'm just going to leave it on method A. This is, this is the default settings on that, and that's fine. I'm just going to hit, hit render here. And if you've never seen this happen, it's kind of cool. It's building that image over here. So you can see more and more of it coming into focus as it gradually walks its way through all of these images. So let's just wait, let it do its thing here for a minute.
and you can see these are the individual images as it's walking through and it's got this one's got a little sharp bit here a little sharp bit here and so that's contributing a little bit to this image and it's 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 going to work its way all the way down here so let's just let it do that I've got a ton of stuff. I've got PowerPoint, I've got Lightroom, I've got Photoshop, I've got uh, Windows Explorer or uh, Chrome open. I've got a ton of stuff open. So uh, if you don't have so much open, uh, this actually usually runs a little faster. So it's done now. Now you can see it's, it's pretty good shape. This is a tiny little baby miter wart uh you know from here up to here was probably an inch and a half or something like that um so here's the this is the initial result from the photo stacking now let me show you what you would, might want to do with this um with with your retouching brush my my stack even though it was this many images didn't quite catch this last little bit so i'm gonna hit retouching here i'm gonna go to the last image on here and i'm just gonna paint that in so i'm taking this side and putting it over here. So all of a sudden I've got something that looks a lot more appealing. And you'll notice there's a slight bit of haloing up here. So again, you can use that retouching brush and you can, you can, you can fix that stuff, which is great. And I usually use, you can set the brush size here, or it's just like Photoshop. You can use your brackets to make this, you know, bigger or smaller, whatever you like. I usually leave the brush hardness around 20 to 25%. That gives me something that is not a real harsh edge to it. Uh, so I'll do that. Now with your with your with your with the uh, scroll on your mouse, you can adjust the magnification, or you can you can do that here as well. And then if you click on this little button here, that shows you what portion of the image you're looking at right now, and you can drag this around. So if you want to look down here, now here's another area where I would use the retouching. Uh, tool. It, it found sharp bits until it got, got down to about here, and then it quit looking. So th this looks a little weird to have it sharp and then very dramatically get unsharp. What would look better to me is again, I'm, uh, is to paint this in and have this look like it's more gradually getting out of focus. So it gives you an idea of the sort of tool, the sort of power that you have um, with this retouching tool. So let's, uh, let's do another example. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go up here, I'm gonna remove all the outputs. That gets rid of that down there. I'm gonna, remove all images. So we got a blank slate here. I'm just gonna go grab some more because I've got some. So we're gonna go in here. I'm gonna select all of these and I'm gonna open those. So it's gonna bring those in. And here we go. And you can see it's kind of populating these. Um, so let's give it a moment, uh, let it kind of 
digest these a little bit and then we'll let it go ahead and do the stack and then we'll uh, we'll start looking at uh, what we might want to do before we're ready to save this off. Almost done here. Keep going just a little bit. Almost done. All right. So we hit render here and uh, let the let the process begin here and it'll start walking through here in a second. Usually it's quite quick about this actually. Here it goes. And you can see that it's sort of starting to um, create that that image where everything's sharp and it's gonna keep going here in a second here it goes it's kind of doing a bunch of them at once kind of let this uh, do its thing here for a, a second and you can see if you if you look at this every once in a while there was a little bit of, of wind and as it goes through these images, sometimes you can see this moving around just a little bit. But over here, everything is aligned great. Um, so the focus stacking software does a, does a fantastic job at dealing with a little bit of wind. Now here's a, a thing that I, I think is, is important to, to talk about. Um, sometimes the focus stacking can be really instrumental to your composition. Now this plant is three or four feet high. It sticks up above um, a lot of the other prairie plants depending on what's around it. And it may be that you really, what you'd really like to do is make sure you've got a good background here. Um, you may want to actually shoot down on this a little bit because you don't want a big horizon line coming right through the middle of this. You'd really rather get up a little higher and shoot down. Well, if you were doing a single shot, then that would mean that the top would be closer to you than the bottom, be extremely difficult to get it all into, into focus, even if you stop down a bit. But with the focus stacking, you can keep the background um, fairly, um, fairly good and still get the uh, focused uh, top to bottom. Again, if you want to, if, if you wanted to get the background bright by moving a little to the right, this part would be closer to you than this part. And again, it would be difficult to keep this, uh, you know, shooting at F4 or whatever I shot it at and got it, get everything in focus. Um, so here's, here's our, our initial result from stacking. Um, one of the things that sometimes it is nice to, to, uh, to, to work on here is the background. Now you notice that this background is a little different from what it looks like over here. This is the first image on the stack right up here and it's, the background is more out of focus here than it is over here. The, the image st stacking software is starting to prepare to get something in focus back here. And it's, and it's made the background a little clunky. But with the retouching tool, if you want to paint in the most out of focus background, you can just do that. And it's fairly subtle on this one, but sometimes it's, it's pretty substantial, um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, just painting that in uh, can make it, can 
make your background look a lot better. So that's another use for the retouching tool. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you can do with that. Once you're done, you hit the save and uh, saving, hit save. It's gonna, by default, uh, give you a, uh, uh, a folder where the initial images came from. Uh, and, and you just, you just put a name in here. So I, I, what I usually do, um, is, is create a name with the, uh, uh, the file number of the initial image and then put it underscore STK. Uh, so that's what I do. So stop. Hey, yes. Uh, uh Hello. I'm sorry. Uh, let my finger off the unmute. Uh, you created TIFF files to load into Helicon Focus. Uh, is, is that something that's necessary, or can you use other types of files? You know, you can use other types of files. I know you can actually. I, I haven't tried this one in a while. I use. I, I did try an experiment one time where I just set uh, um, raw files in. Nikon raw files, um, and it it accepted it. It did the stack, but when I looked at it, it, it the detail wasn't as good as, as the TIFF files. So I like having TIFF files coming back. They're the sort of the next best thing to a raw file. So I usually export TIFF files, and then then I, that's what I get back from it. Thanks. All right, let's uh, go to one last thing here. Final post processing. So you've got it out of that. And, and sometimes you need to do a little cleanup. Um, and there are things when, when something, when two elements of your picture intersect, and they aren't on the same plane of focus or really close to each other, then you can get some artifacts that you really, uh, you'd be good to clean up. Here's an example of it. Here's the, here's the image coming out of the photo stacking software. When it assembles the picture, this is out in front. It, it can get the edge of this pedal just fine. When it's starting to assemble this part of the stem behind it, when it gets up here, this, this pedal is out of focus. And when it's out of focus, it's bigger and it blocks some area. You, you're just stuck with that. And you're stuck with that more when you shoot at a, at a wider aperture than you do if you were shooting at F11 or something like that. Um, so I want to go fix those things up. Uh, so let's let's just go into here. Um, I'm gonna fire up this. Hang with me just for a second. I'm gonna get Photoshop started up here, and then I'll share that. I'll be with you in just a second. Uh, this is where All right. Now I can go back to do my Zoom session share Photoshop. And here we go. Should be seeing that. All set. So let's go in here and um, going really close, probably a little too close here. What I'd like to fix is this area right in here. So I use my clone tool. 
what you got to realize is that this piece of the stem right here is indistinguishable from the missing piece. So you can go, hit, I hit the Alt button right here. I line that up here and I can just paint in that missing part there. And just fill in those areas. Do the same thing here. I hit the Alt button that establishes where I'm cloning from. Go up here and I can just go here. And what you want to do is where you have an edge, grab that edge, line that up here, click once, and then do that. I'll do a little more up here just so you can get an idea. Click once there, bring that down, line it up, and just fix that area. Grab that line. If you want the lines to line up and fix that area. So I to kind of do edge patrol around a lot of different areas and, and, and fix those things. Let me just, um, let me send one other thing over here. And I'll do one more quick example and then uh, we'll finish this up. So here's, here's our downy sunflower. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a bit here. It looks pretty good until you start looking really close and you've got kind of a messy area looking right here. And you've got a little bit of a messy area in here. And this isn't because, you know, the photo, the stacking software is, is you know, is, is faulty in some way. It's, ju it's just a, a problem with optics and you, it's hard to fight optics. But I'll just, I'll, I'll just go grab that edge right there. You know, it's gonna start putting it in place. I'm gonna line it up right there. And I just paint that in, works great. Do it again right here. And all of a sudden this area looks a whole lot better than it does on the original image. Again here, you can, you can grab a piece of this stem right here, line it up right here, and all of a sudden, you know, this looks a whole lot better. Bring this right up in there. Doing this a little quick, but kind of get the idea, I think. You know, the fact that you don't have any halo to the, to the left of this, you can use that advantage right up in here and draw that right in there. So there's a lot of cleanup that I like to do. Um, you know how much you want to spend doing this. You don't see a, you don't see all of it um, when you're looking at full size. But if 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 you were submitting this to the calendar and somebody was going to actually look at this closely, I think you want to clean up some of these areas and 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 really make them good. And Photoshop is it's really pretty easy to do that. So there's some post-processing that I like to do there. So let me stop sharing that. Oops. Hang on just a second. I'll get back to. There we go. I now need to go back in here.
share that. And we're about wrapped up here. Back to the presentation. So, you know, once I get it done, then you can make any final adjustments you need, exposure, clarity, vibrance, a final crop, because if you do them now, then you can, you can change your mind about any of these adjustments and, and, and just move the sliders again. If you've done it before the photo stack, then you can't change your mind so easily on those. You might have to go through the whole process of doing the stack again. So just in general, more images, the better. Uh, Helicon Focus seems to handle 30, 40, 50, 60 images uh, without choking. Doesn't seem to be a big problem. Uh, check your framing in the field. Give yourself a little extra room so that uh, and just uh, count on uh, doing a little final crop at the very end. Have patience while you're out in the field. Wait for the wind to die down. Wait for a calm moment to, to create your stack. Uh, do pay particular attention to the highlights uh, on your initial processing and, and use that live view. You know, it's like any other technique that you use with your camera. If you practice it enough, then you don't have to think about it a whole lot when you're in the field. And that's that's really where you want to get on your focus stacking. So this just, you know, just something that uh, just comes pretty naturally uh, and allows you to really focus on what's important which is you know finding the flowers, finding the examples that you want to take pictures of, and uh, getting a good composition on those pictures. So here's the disclaimers. It's it's this is all just based on what I do. Uh, doesn't mean you have to do it the same way. Uh, one of the one of the wonderful things and one of the you know, frustrating things about Lightroom and Photoshop particularly is that there's a thousand different ways to do the same thing. So I've just shown you one or two. Uh, you may have other ways that you want to do it. Uh, and, and certainly practice, practice, practice. So with that, um, let me open it up, see if there's any questions, um, comments, uh, it's, it's harder to throw rotten tomatoes on Zoom, but there's probably a way to do that as well. I just don't know about. Um, are there any questions? Dave, this is VJ. Yes, VJ. Uh, I got a question for you. Uh, when you're doing a photo stacking of landscape, what uh, f-stop do you normally use? You know, I will... Um, yeah, I, I probably you you know stop it down a little bit more um, because I don't want to have to create tons and tons of of, of images. Uh, if I've got a, a lens that's sharp at f11, I'll use f11. Uh, you know, by the time you're getting to f16, f22, something like that, um, you might actually be able to do it in a single image if you've got a wide angle lens. Uh, but uh, you know, kind of. You can you can use f8, f11, something like that, and and still a half dozen images is probably all you would need, unless you're, um, you know, using a long telephoto and doing landscapes with that, and you've got, you know, a, a, a lot of depth of field that you need with that. It's something it's it's a little bit, um, you know, you just have to practice and figure. Out kind of figure it out um, by experience as much as anything. Thank you. Jean? Um, I may have missed this, but are you shooting, you're shooting raw, are you shooting Nikon like NEP images? Are you, yes. Okay, so are you going in like the 50 you took of a plant? Are you just, mass changing those all over to TIFF images or one at a time, or how do you do that? 
when when I hit the export button, when I say export to Helicon Focus, that's when it's it's creating the TIFFs and and sending them over. Those aren't they were normally those aren't aren't kept on your hard drive. You know, that's you all, okay. all those things show up as 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 things that Helicon uses temporarily. And then when you exit Helicon Focus, it deletes all those, those TIFF files, except for the output that you saved off. Yeah, okay. All right, yes, I remember that part now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, the one one uh, comment I had, I've, I've stacked up to uh, 150 images uh, at, a, at a time and uh, Helicon just, it, does take its time as we saw loading up the images and then starting to, to process through them. So sometimes it's wise to start a focus stack and then just um, run off and get a cup of coffee. Certainly that case when you're exporting particularly, uh, you know, uh, you know, I've got a, a, a Nikon, I've got a large sensor on my camera so those TIFF files can be 200 megabytes a, a, a pop. And if you're asking Lightroom to create, you know, 40 or 50, 200 megabyte files, it, ju it just takes a little while, so. Dave, uh, I've got another question for you. Yeah. After you finish photo stacking, do you delete the original images? Uh, do I, I'm sorry, do I use any what? Do you delete your original images? from your hard drive? Oh, what I do is, um, uh, let, me, let, me sh let me show you. I think I've still got Lightroom here. Um, let's go up here. Um, what I do is, is, is it, Lightroom calls it a stack, but, um, you know, here's all my images of, of that cardinal flower. If you right click, you can you can say group into a stack. When you when you when you do that, it just puts them all sort of on top of each other. So it you don't see all of them, but they're just sort of you can see the number of of images here. And then when you keyword uh, the top image, it doesn't keyword all the ones in the stack. So I could always redo the stack if I want to. So I, I keep them just because, you know, hard disk spaces is really cheap. Um, so I, I keep them around. Yeah, thank you. All right, it sounds like maybe we've exhausted everybody or at least exhausted the questions. Um, so thank you everybody for uh, coming out tonight. I hope it was uh, entertaining. hope it was uh, useful to everybody. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. It was great. Thank you, Dave. Good night, everybody. Thank you.